<laughs> despite the, uh, the drive for, <coughs> for uh, monopoly, despite the, despite the mentality of these, of many businessmen, of monopoly is the key thing, will provide more efficiency and lower costs and higher prices and all that. Really, by the end of this period, we're talking about only oil, sugar, and corn products were dominated by a single company. And steel was 60%, not, not 90, but there we also see the collapse of the U.S. steel uh, attempt. Um, there's also, again, there's charming examples of what happens here. There's also the so-called whiskey trust. Uh, <coughs> 80 small firms in the whiskey industry to form the Distillers and Cattle Feeders Trust in 1887. And... Uh, <coughs> first thing they did is they concentrated their production at the 21 plants. They scrapped the other plants. They kind of figured they'll raise prices, cut production. And uh, the price of whiskey was then raised. Okay. So what happens? What happens is it stimulates a group of small local new firms suddenly pop into the whiskey business and undercut the, 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 the stores and cattle feeders trust. So what do they all, all right, so what do you do? Here you have the stores and cattle feeders trust. They're trying to form a monopoly. They desperately, you know, they get all these guys together. They merge. And finally, they find these, these crumbs suddenly pop up and undercut them. What do they do about it? Either they can ignore it, in which case they lose their monopoly, or they buy them out. But again, they can't keep buying out people forever, and so they went bankrupt in 1896. So sort of, uh, again, just as triumphant. And they try that again. Another distiller's company tries it later <coughs> and reaches a kind of a similar thing. They have a competitor that's been to pop up again in the early 1900s. A uh, similar thing happens in the National Biscuit Company, which tried to establish a monopoly. Originally, the National Biscuit Company was not just a, beloved, a lovable producer of unique biscuits, which they are. They also tried to establish a monopoly. It was originally supposed to be the monopoly company, 100% producer of biscuits and all other such stuff. Uh, it was originally, in 1998, the National Biscuit Company was formed as a giant combination of three regional giant combinations. It was a great national thing. And they tried their best to control prices and production, limit competition, buy out the competition. They tried to buy out every, every new biscuit company that popped up. Too expensive, and they met disaster at this, uh, this uh, process. And finally, in 1901, this is, you know, it was only three years, but it was a very traumatic three years for the National Biscuit Company. And finally, in 1901, they gave up. They said, they have a brilliant, a beautiful annual report, which Professor Chandler quotes from in his famous article. <coughs> Uh, on big business, the title of big business, something like that. Anyway, it's a classic article and justly reprinted and, many, and widely reprinted. The National, 1901 National Biscuit Company gives up the idea of controlling prices, for, you know, cutting production, raising prices, monopolizing everything, and saying we've had it, we're almost bankrupt. They change the idea of cutting costs, of improving efficiency, and not worrying too much about the competition, having systematic marketing and so forth, and improving the quality of the biscuit. Uh, they decided we're not going to buy out anybody else, but how them. Uh, and what they did when they decided not to buy out anybody else, they came up with a great invention that you need a biscuit. The first, <laughs> the phrase, the first consumer, really was a great market innovation. The first guys to sell packaged cookies, uh, packaged stuff for the consumer, uh, packaged crackers. Nobody had really thought of that before. You know, before that, even when I was growing up, and I'm not that old. <laughs> when I was growing up, you didn't really buy packaged stuff from the consumer much. You really, you went to the uh, to the grocery. You went to the grocery store and you bought. The grocery had a tub of butter. And they had a bunch of pickle, a jar of pickles, and you sort of reach in, you say, well, give me a you know, slice off a quarter pound of butter, and the guy would go and hack away at his big tub. There was no brake stone or fire stone or other stuff. It was just butter. <laughs> <laughs> and we, didn't, we were deprived of a choice between brands. We couldn't pick between this, this kind of margarine, this kind of butter, and this kind of corn oil. It was just butter. You know, you went to the grocery store, and there was this yellow stuff, and they, they hacked it off. And this was the, so the, the idea of consumer brands is very new. It's really, uh, <laughs> As a great thing because now we can we can pick we can choose between Malamars and Edith biscuits and then <laughs> stuff like that. Now some people, some of the health nuts around here might scorn this <laughs> these choices, but I think it's important. <laughs> um, let me quote from the annual the, NBC, the National Biscuit Company's annual report of 1901 announcing this change. They say, quote. When we look back over the four years, that was the four years, the four miserable years they've been in existence. When we look back over the four years, we find that a radical change has been wrought in our methods of business. When this company started, it was thought we must control competition, and, and that to do this, we must either fight competition or buy it. Either it was drive it to the wall in some way or buy that. 
Uh, the first meant a ruinous war of prices, so he rejected that idea, and a great loss of profit, right? The second, a constantly increasing capitalization, buying more and more of these competitors. Experience soon proved to us that instead of bringing success, either of these courses, if persevered in, must bring disaster. <clears throat> this led us to reflect whether it was necessary to control competition. We soon satisfied ourselves that within the company itself, we must look for success. We turned our attention and bent our energies to improving the internal management of our business, to getting full benefit from purchasing our raw materials in large quantities, to, econ to economizing the expenses of manufacture, to systematizing and rendering more effective our selling department, and above all things and before all things to improve the quality of our goods and the condition in which they should reach the customer. It became the subtle policy of this company to, to buy out no competition. Uh, and this, this really sort of, sort of says it, that the experience of the market, they didn't arrive at this through laissez-faire theory, they arrived at it through hard-nosed uh, empirical, uh, you know, as Marxists would say, they were educated through struggle. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, uh, incidentally, I, one of my brightest students that I've had in my sort of marketing and history last year was sort of converted from, from anti-trust busting and laissez-faire by reading this, this report. I think it's kind of a cute, uh, he was pushed over the brink by that. Um, all right, we have a uh, similar thing uh, in agricultural machinery. Once again, J.P. Morgan, the Mephistophelian hand of J.P. Morgan at work, uh, tries to set up a monopoly in agricultural machinery, sets up the International Harvester Company, along with McCormick's, and, uh, in 1902. Uh, this is supposed to be another great monopoly, tapping the uh, you know uh, efficiencies of giant scale production center. What happens to international harvester? Crummy situation, singularly unprofitable. There are fights between the McCormicks and the Deerings who have been merging this thing. There were there was a great deal of lethargy, there's poor organization, overconfidence, and there was a great decline in their shares of the market. In 1903, uh, international harvester had 91% of the mowers in the country, produced 91% of the mowers and 96% of the binders. By 1911, they were reduced from 96 to 87 percent of the miners and from 91 to 75 percent of the mowers. And the harvesters were reduced from 85 percent in 1902 to 64 percent in 1918. So but by the time, you know, after 10, 20 years are over, international harvesters are being cut down systematically to size, so to speak. Uh, and the non-merged companies begin to expand. The competitors are not in on this great monop attempted monopoly in the free market, uh, such as Deere and Company, J.I. Case, expand and fill in uh, the interstices, so to speak, of this, this operation. Uh, to continue the story, in 1922, as I think I said, well, total farm machinery, international harvester had 44% of the total farm machinery in 1922. By 1948, it had 23%, a steady decline, steady and happy decline for those of us who like to see this sort of thing happen. Uh, and also, they would lag behind the new combine market. They were the last guys to get in the combines and behind on the, on the idea of rubber rubber tire tractors and so forth and so on, behind again in fundamental innovations in, the, in their particular industry. <coughs> um, the, uh, I was mentioned something about Morgan, the, the, uh, as I think Forrest touched on, before uh, pro late 1890s, the funds for these combinations came essentially from manufacturers themselves, the pooling of their assets. After 1897, particularly in the famous great merger wave, 1897-1901, approximately, the great merger boom, essentially you have a key role of the Wall Street financiers in this thing, investment bankers and commercial bankers. The industrial stock market was just really coming in then. Uh, before that, really, the stock market was largely, was largely railroad bonds and, and government bonds, that sort of thing. Uh, so it's really these investment bankers, the Morgan types, promoted the great merger wave in 1897-1901. Uh, okay, we, we also have the Sugar Trust. Um, the, uh, this is, I'm referring now to the great article by Richard Zerby on you know, the Sugar, Sugar Trust in Journal of Rolling Economics. Um, I mentioned before that he, he showed that there was no predatory price cutting. It was all tempted to be done by, by mergers. The, um, Right, we had an increasing concentration of, of sugar in the 1860s to 1880s, approximately. And uh, one of the things that, that stimulated it was an increase in the tariff, a uh, high tariff 
and sugar. And there were a lot of abortive cartels in the, in the 1880s, and they collapsed once again. The same story begins to repeat itself. Um, the, uh, the sugar industry, oddly, that was kind of a peculiar thing. It was largely concentrated in Brooklyn <laughs> in that period. <laughs> uh, the, uh, there were ten firms, there was geographically, and it was heavily concentrated. Uh, there were ten sugar firms in New York City, sugar manufacturers in the 1880s, and six of them were in Brooklyn, three of the largest firms were in Brooklyn. The, uh, the key guy, of course, in the sugar industry in this period was Henry O. Havemeyer, the Havemeyer family and American Sugar Refining Company and so forth. Ha it was Havemeyer who coined the great phrase, the tariff is the mother of all trusts, as far as I know. It was Havemeyer who said, quote, the mother of all trusts is the customs tariff bill. The existing bill, which is tariff 1897, and the preceding ones have been the, have been the occasion of the formation of all large trusts. Uh, the idea, again, is you have to keep out foreign competition in order to be able to have any kind of successful trust at all. Uh, <clears throat> and there's a the saga of the, sh the, sh the sugar trust saga can be pretty well outlined um, as far as the tariff goes. Kind of a cute thing here. Let's list this. Here we have the price of British sugar in Sugar refinery had to close up shop pretty well, except for the huge tariff, which you know, which makes English sugar uncompetitive and allows Havemeyer to do his dirty work uh, trying to cartelize, cartelize the sugar industry. Um, the Sugar Trust, of course, the sugar refining company, lobbied very heavily for for high, higher tariffs on, on refined sugar and lower tariffs on raw sugar. The, of course, the sugar industry have a peculiar situation. We buy sugar from Cuba raw sugar, we refine it in the United States and we sell it. So the idea was you have to uh, be a big, big free trade theorist when it comes to raw sugar <laughs> and be a big American system theorist when it comes to refined sugar. Uh, and, the, and the fortunes of the sugar industry in this period are, can be directly related. You want to go through the time, I don't want to go through the time for this, directly related to the, to the fortunes of tariffs. You know, tariff goes up, goes down, tariff on raw sugar goes up, goes down immediately. The profits are affected, the prices are affected, sugar industry. Um, the, uh, in 1887, the sugar, so-called sugar trust is formed, the American Sugar Refining Company, to be more specific, more accurate, uh, with 80% of the total American sugar refining output, formed obviously under the stimulus of this, uh, this big tariff. I mean, Havermeyer, again, was obviously being completely accurate when he said that he would never have even try to form a sugar sugar trust without the without the high tariff, <coughs> uh, and uh, what they try to do was to uh, was to lower production and raise price within, of course, this tariff you know this tariff protection. Uh, so in 1888, 
they, they were originally 20 plants, 20 sugar plants in the sugar trust. They reduced it to 10. They put 10 out of business, either dismantling them or combining them in some way. And uh, they operated at a very uh, only uh, much less than full capacity, even even with the just half the plants. And uh, in 1888, they already dropped in one year after this cartel arrangement, even within the, the tariff bar tariff war. In one year's time, they were they had full, the American Sugar Refining Company's share of the market had fallen from 80 percent to 73 percent. Especially on the West Coast, they had fallen to 50 percent. Because what happened is in the West Coast. The Hawaiian sugar manufacturer, the so-called sugar king of the Sandwich Islands, Klaus Spreckels, enters the sugar industry <laughs> in California, zips into California because here, boy, oh boy, here's this guy have a mine. He's raised the sugar prices, a lot of profits here. Let's produce some sugar refiner, sugar uh, refineries. And so Spreckels begins to build sugar refineries on the West Coast. So not only do they have, you know, not only is this is the feat of purpose, the have a mine's purpose of having this monopoly cartel kind of situation, but he has. He's faced with a permanent pain in the neck, which is Spreckles, you know, permanent new competition coming up, which, which wouldn't have been called into being without this, you know, the original higher price. Um, the, uh, <coughs> the price of, before this attempted monopoly, the price of sugar had been falling. Uh, for 1881, it was 9.2 cents a pound. This represents a fall. Before the before the attempted trust, uh, the trust comes in 1888. The price goes up from seven cents to 7.6 cents, and bingo, Spreckles nips in, and uh, and now we have a problem. The production is the, the production of Spreckles and the other the other independents increases from 8,000 barrels a day to 10,000 barrels a day, and we wind up uh, with a sugar trust. By 1889, the sugar trust has only 66 percent of total sugar output. In other words, in two years. The American Sugar Refining Company share of the market falls from 80 percent to 66 percent. Uh, and let's say Spreckles pops up with new plants, and the, the price of sugar begins to fall. Finally, goes down about 4.7 cents. Um, <coughs> and there's a whole attempt, and then the sugar trust tries to buy Spreckles out, the, and he does buy Spreckles out. And we have the American Sugar Refining Company in 1892, a newly, a newly reorganized company which have bought Spreckles and six other people, and uh, now has 95% of the sugar production. Figure, okay, we bought Spreckles out, we're in great shape, we have 90% of the production product. There's only two independents left in the great 1892 merger. There are only two independents left. One small plant in Boston, which is making only 500 barrels of sugar a day, and another two teeny plants in Louisiana that were making 400 a day. It's practically nothing. Uh, otherwise, there was only... Uh, Beet sugar, which only was about 4% of sugar production in those days, is really amounted to very little. So here's okay, we finally have the reorganized thing. We bought Spreckles out. We have this great little Spreckles Havemeyer Alliance. Now what? Well, all sorts of old sugar hands are gonna are gonna come back into the business. Say, hey, we got higher prices, we got you know <laughs> higher profits. And we have uh, uh, two gentlemen named Adolf Siegel and Fred Frederick Hippel who went into the business of producing sugar plants, of building sugar plants, so that the sugar refining company have to buy it. Once again we have this so-called blackmail arrangement. It's really a great thing. You don't have to really, you don't have to really be a good, good sugar manufacturer. All you have to do is to build a plant, and then some guy has to buy it. <laughs> Takes it off your hands. So um, at one time, the sugar was pretty sore when they found out they bought a plant from Hippo and Siegel. They found out there was no water supply there. And the whole thing was there was hardly any, there was no equipment. <laughs> the whole thing was a big, a big rip-off, as you would say. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> And this, so this continues on, and by 1894, uh, with the same process, only two years after the American Sugar Refining Company has 95% of total sugar production, by 1894 they have only 85%. They've dropped 10% in two years, and the price starts falling again, because they have to compete for these new independents popping up. Uh, 1895-96, they try it all over again. They have a new cartel arrangement between the old the sugar refining company, the old Havamaya Spreckles people, the new guys. And they have now a cartelization covering 90% of production. The price of sugar then goes up. The price of sugar had fallen du during this competitive period from 4.8 cents to 4.1 cents a pound. And now went up to 4.5 cents a half cent per pound. Okay, I'll raise it a little bit. So everything is hunky dory for about a year. And then a new guy enters the picture, a new old sugar guy who sort of dropped out of the business and done something else, Klaus Dorscher. And the Arbuckle brothers, and the, the ancestor of the famous Fatty Arbuckle. 
and a little bit more astute than Fatty Arnold. <laughs> so the Arnold brothers and Dorsher enter the business. They nip in here. They take advantage of the high tariff. They take advantage of the higher prices, the higher profits. They're going great, great guns. And uh, and uh, they begin to win out on the competitive struggle. And by 1898, which is only two years later, uh, they're down to 75 percent of the in the, of the output. Of the Back down to 75, and the price of sugar falls again. It was essentially all buckle, by the way, who broke the cartel with a, a lower cost and a superior product. Um, all buckle developed the idea of, of uh, coffee packaging. Sugar was usable for coffee, which apparently hadn't been thought of very much before. It's a big new, a big new thing, which again seems obvious to us. Uh, well, they. Uh, so what do they do about this? Well, they form another cartel. I mean, these guys didn't give up for a long time. They were indefatigable. 1901, Havemeyer and Arbuckle get together and form a, a new sugar cartel, including almost all the eastern refiners. Uh, and they, they, the Speckles didn't want to join. The Speckles, by this time, had nipped out and built some more plants. <laughs> well, he wasn't sold for life for this whole thing. And he vandalized his plant. There's one case, apparently, authentic case, where they, they sabotaged his plant. Uh, and... Uh, and we have, so we have another great merger. In 1902, we have a new merger, the American Sugar Refining Company, with 90% of the total output. We're back up finally, painfully again, at 90%. Profits went up. Sugar price went up, 5.3 cents. Uh, and, uh, and once again, we, we start up. Uh, the West Coast pops up again. Uh, California pops up again. Um, the uh, Hawaiian sugar plantations pop up again. A new Hawaiian guy start building plants in California and shipping the sugar to California in the refinery. And uh, that, so that doesn't, that doesn't work either. And also the beet sugar people hadn't been heard from before now begin to zip into the market. I mean, price of sugar is going up, profits are going up. Let's sell, start selling beet sugar. Uh, there also have been a higher tariff for refined sugar in 19, the tariff 1897, which also, also prompted them to enter this picture. So all of a sudden we have a new beet sugar interest, and we have the Louisiana cane sugar people again to increase their production. And uh, and so then the sugar trust feel they have to start buying up the beet sugar companies. They start racing around to try to buy these people up. They're, they're becoming a threat. Well, as I say, none of this really worked. Uh, again, we have the same sort of pattern. The the uh, 1902. When the final, when this final beet sugar thing was 90% of the total output, uh, by 90, 1905 they only had 70% of the total output. By 1907 they had 60%. By 1911 they had 54%. And beet sugar kept popping up more and more, and raising their share from 4 to 14%. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> and also in cane sugar, more competition comes up. Spreckles comes up again. Uh, other plants come up, as in California, and so uh, and so by 1905, as I said, we're down to 70 percent and 60 percent and 54 percent. The, the Great Sugar Trust didn't work. After all these constant headaches, after buying out people, and all the rest of it, the thing the thing collapsed because we didn't have a governmental government promotion or encouragement of the cartel, a government enforcement of the cartel. Uh, the refined sugar price and then it begins to fall once again from 5.3 cents down to about 4.4. 4. Uh, they try to have international, private international cartel agreement. That didn't work either. And as we'll see again, once again, World War I, just as in the steel industry, just as, just as World War I brought, brought joy to the hearts of Judge Gary, so in the sugar industry, World War I brought, brought joy to the hearts of the sugar, sugar manufacturers. They finally came into their own. Uh, World War One brought joy to the hearts of many people in the United States. Not those, of course, who were killed. <laughs> um, Havemeyer again to have another quote on the tariff from Havemeyer. He said, um, he said that the sugar refining had been built up under quote enormous protection. Without the tariff, I doubt if we should have dared to take the risk of forming the trust. I certainly should not have risked all I had in a trust unless the business had been protected as it was by the tariff. But even that, even with the tariff protection, the thing collapsed.
they finally, what they finally had to do was simply uh, you know, keep the price low, keep the profit margins low, and not not keep stimulating increased competition, which of course is what the whole thing is all about anyway. So they gave up the idea, really, of trying to establish a monopoly price. Uh, well, I think uh, more on this, but uh, I think I'll stop at this point. I have a little bit more on the on the failure of the trust and cartels I'll deal with tomorrow, and probably we'll start in on a progressive uh, progressive period attempts to counteract uh, the winds of the free market. Get back to the. Failure of the trust and so forth. Uh, <coughs> in the uh, by the as by the by 19 even by 1900 by the early 1900s, as Walter Block raised the question, how come these guys didn't learn about it? Forrest mentioned that the Morgan. I think it was a very good statement about the Morgans benefiting from my commissions for forming trusts, etc. But uh, various businessmen were beginning to see as early as 1900 that the things are the trust thing doesn't seem to be working. Uh, various theoreticians, so to speak, in, in business. Um, <clears throat> for example, in the iron and steel industries, I think I might have mentioned, numerous independent firms pop up after U.S. Steel is founded, and they start to share in the alleged profits and mergers and so forth. And uh, Iron Age, Iron Age, the magazine of the iron and steel industry, writes um, writes about this rather sadly. Uh, it's issued September 20th, 1900, and says uh, this is especially true. This collapse of you know of, of the merger because of new firms coming in and competing. This is especially true where the combination is <coughs> is naming, as they put it, or fixing confessedly high prices for its goods, and is at the same time under heavy expenses on account of buying out competitors or subsidizing them to keep out of the market. So Iron Age saw this thing as early as. 1900, even before the U.S. the final U.S. steel merger, uh, and in November 1st, 19, 1900, Iron Age again says, "Quote: The most serious problem that confronts trust combinations today is competition from independent sources. When the papers speak of a cessation of operation in certain trust industries, they fail to mention the awakening of new life in independent plants." So they're seeing this. I mean, the, the, the more the more thoughtful members. Of the, Business community have already latched onto this even as late as, as early as 1900. There are other there are other trusts that this, the same thing happens to. There's, for example, the wallpaper trust, which breaks up rather, rather quickly in uh, about uh, eight years or so. Uh, <coughs> the um, Continental Company Limited, formed in 1899 or 1900, controlling 95% of the sales of screw doors and windows uh, dissolved in one year. Uh, one, one crummy year <laughs> from, a, from this commanding height of 95% of the business dissolves. Why? Because of growing competition due to the high prices that they were trying to charge and their failure to achieve any kind of real econo economies you know, of cost. Incidentally, I, I, I also second uh, Forrest McDonald's statement about the cheap money. That's a very important point about the, which stimulates, stimulated the merger movement of that period. Benjamin M. Anderson, in his great work, Economics and Public Welfare, also points to this as being one of the, really the key things that spurred the, this merger movement. Uh, a couple of other cases. I don't want to bore you with too many cases, but I find them kind of fascinating. Uh, the Leather Trust. Uh, here we have a highly competitive industry making sole leather. Uh, we have a lot of small firms, very little capital required to invest in any particular firm. And uh, they're mostly concentrated in southern New York and Pennsylvania. Five of the largest firms get together and form the U.S. Leather Company in 1893, controlling 58% of the tanned sole leather, and 72% of hemlock tanned, and 45% uh, of union tanned, etc. As a matter of fact, when it was formed in 1893, the U.S. Leather Company was the largest single, the largest capitalized firm in the country at the time, uh, totaling $130 million of capital. The Standard Oil Trust, for example, Standard Oil in New Jersey was only $102 million at that point. Uh, so what do they expect, the tanners? They expect that the end of competition would bring them high prices, prosperity, high profits, and economies of large-scale production. <coughs> Yet, what happens to the U.S. Leather Company? 
almost immediately they start they lose 1.3 million dollars like that. No dividends on their common stock. Their profits continue to be very low. The stock the stock collapses. Uh, why is that? Well, it was a business slump. They, they also they'd overexpanded their uh, their assets. Uh, they had a their prices continue to be competitive, even though they're because they, they couldn't really they finally they finally couldn't raise their prices because the small tanners that were competing with them were very well entrenched. There were a lot of large, a lot of independents, there were a lot of large oak and union tanners because they, they really only sort of controlled the, the, the hemlock tanning. And they found out that the, the small businesses often had very superior management to them. And uh, at the end of this saga, which took 11 years, by 1904, the U.S. leather company, quote, reorganized, unquote. In other words, goes bankrupt. That was the end of the leather trust. There's also the saga of the cornstarch trust. Uh, I think I mentioned uh, yesterday. There were three companies, three leading industries where there was almost a monopoly, oil, uh, cornstarch and uh, sugar. Uh, the cornstarch, we, gonna, we have a highly competitive industry. We start with a highly competitive industry with falling prices and so forth. We have uh, uh, <coughs> they, they form, in, around 1890, they form a national starch manufacturing company, a merger of 20 starch factories, uh, controlling about 70% of the total, total starch output, including the largest single factory in the business. Uh, so what happens? Well, what happens is they get severe competition suddenly coming in from Western corn, bulk, Western bulk starch. There are two kinds of starch, apparently. Bulk starch going to manufacturers and box starch which went to the consumers. Uh, so they find severe competition from Western bulk starch. And then they find that after five years, see what happens is one of the guys who merged with them, one of the large firms merging with, to form uh, the largest factory, I should say, forming this national starch manufacturing combine, was the Duryea Glencove Manufacturing Company, presumably out there on the Duryea family in Long Island. And uh, they signed this thing saying, you know, for five years we're not going to enter the business. Well, five years are up, Duryea zips into the business again, build new plants, you know, more competitive, more newer than the previous ones, and becomes highly competitive. And the, the relative output of National Starch Manufacturing Company sinks. <laughs> uh, 1899, they, they started, they try not to try, they, they try it again. Duryea included this time. We have the United Starch Company, uh, which um, included the union of the four biggest box starch companies at the time. And in 1900, the whole group merges of the, the United Starch Company, the old National Starch uh, Manufacturing Company, and the U.S. Glucose Company all merge into one giant, gigantic National Starch Company, capitalized at $21 million. And the National Starch Company now has 90% of the box starch in the country and 75% of the total starch, box and bulk. So they're pretty, you know, they, they think of themselves in pretty good shape. They expect big monopoly profits and so forth. What happens? Profits are low. Profits are crummy. They find the marketing costs are very high, are doing very well. And they try to raise, rise, uh, oh, and what happens is they, uh, the rise in the price of corn, which they're trying to affect, uh, shifts. Uh, the mills, the mills were buying starch. They try to raise the, corn, the price of corn starch. The mills start buying uh, potato starch, a new gimmick, which so suddenly pops in, which has not been monopolized. Uh, in addition to that, independent mills, independent corn starch mills, pop up. New hydraulic processes, better, you know, lower cost plants, and uh, more uh, more rapid uh, production, and so forth. The, the profits for National Starch, starch Company fall, uh, and very soon, very quickly, they're down to 40% of the share of the market from their original 90. <coughs> there's um, that's the starch. There's also the glucose trust. There's an obscure technological <laughs> uh, connection between starch and glucose, which I'm not going to go into because I'm, I feel on rather shaky ground dealing with the technology of starch and glucose. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> there's a glucose industry, and the glucose firms try to make a form of pool. 1885, from 1885 to 1890, it's big glucose pooling, and they assign quotas of production to each plant. Every plant gets this you know, allocated quota, and uh, we have first the American Glucose Company, which has 65% of the glucose market. Uh, but so what happens? Well, newer manufacturers come in, they increase their production, and they try to 
they try to bring them into the quota system. That means each quota, you know, for each each member of the glucose American Glucose Company team has to cut their production. And we wind up with all these these headaches. In a very short amount of time, a few years, the American Glucose Company is down to 45 percent from its original 65 percent of the market. Uh, one of the things that happens is the Chicago Sugar Refining Company breaks the pool, just you know, just breaks it, and starts breaks it away, and starts increasing its production and cutting prices. Engages in severe competition with the American Glucose Company, which even sinks more rapidly. So in 1897, they try, okay, we'll bring them all together. And they have a mighty consolidation of six large companies into the Glucose Sugar Refining Company, worth $40 million and controlling 85% of the glucose market. <clears throat> and this time, the Chicago Sugar Refining Company is back in as, as the largest plant. And the American Glucose Company is also included, so we have this mighty merger. Okay. Uh, and they raise the price of glucose. At first, they're making high profits. Yippee, they're, they're in. So what happens? Well, it stimulates the high profits, stimulate new manufacturers entering the industry. And new glucose firms pop up. The Illinois Sugar Refining Company, National Starch Company, the Charles Paper Glucose Company, which cuts prices of the candy manufacturers. And the New York Glucose Company, which is essentially Standard Oil subsidiary. All these guys nip in with more modern machinery, and the, and the glucose sugar refining company is in big trouble. By 1901, only four years after they, they were formed with 85% of the market, they're down to 45% of the market and making severe losses and their stocks are collapsing, the stock price of the stock is collapsing and so forth. Finally, in 1902, they haven't given up yet. Another consolidation takes place promoted by the bankers of the, of the Glucose Sugar Refining Company, the National Sugar Company, the Charles Pope Company, the Illinois Sugar Refining Company, and, and <coughs> New York Glucose Company, are, I think, half of their stock. And the one giant company, the Corn Products Company, capitalized at $76 million with 80% of the starch and glucose market. And they expect, boy, oh, boy, now they're going to have high profits. They have this virtual monopoly. They scrap many of their plants to reduce production. So what happens? Very, very quickly, once again, New starch factories, new glucose factories nip in the market. Uh, the Peel Brothers Company, the Warner Company, Corn Products Company finds itself again with declining profits. Again, the high cost of corn, <laughs> again, the corn market, uh, uh, limits the market for corn. By the second year of the Corn Products Company, they're suffering heavy losses, their stock prices collapse, and um, by 1903, which is one year after Corn Products Company was formed with 80% of the market, they're down to 45% of the, of the entire starch glucose business, which apparently has now been consolidated. They're down to 45%. Their stock has collapsed. Uh, by 1906, a new consolidation takes place. The Corn Products Company, New York Glucose, Warner, and St. Louis Glucose into the Corn Products Refining Company with 91% of the market. Uh, excuse me, $91 million and 74% of the market, except at this time they decided they're not going to try to raise prices, they're not going to try to buy up all the competitors, they're going to stick to low-cost production and distribution and sort of go the way of National Biscuit Company and become a regular company and, and not try to be a monopoly. That's essentially the corn product glucose starch saga. Uh, <laughs> quick survey of the saga. <laughs> uh, okay, and I have some, well, some overall assessments here of this thing. Um, of the nearly 100 companies of this type, consolidated trust companies formed in 1999-1900, in by 1900, in other words, after one year, three quarters were not paying dividends. Three quarters were in, 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 in bad, sh bad financial shape. Most of the hopes of the promoters, at least the hopes of being to the public, were not realized. New competition was, you know, comes pouring in, in almost all of these cases. And the various overall figures, Coco points out in his triumph of conservatism, of the 50 largest of well, the 50 largest corporations in 1909. By 1919, by 1919, uh, you know, 1919, 10 years later, seven had dropped out of the top 100. And by 1929, 20 had dropped out. 20 of the 50 had dropped out of the top 100, not just the top 50. Of the 100 largest corporations in 1909, 47 had dropped out of the top 100 by 1919, and 61 had dropped out by 1929. So we have a very mobile kind of situation, very high turnover of the top corporations in this, in this period. Uh, Arthur Dewing has done a great, excellent quantitative study of, the, of these, of these, what happened to these trusts. Uh, it was reprinted finally in his mammoth 
two volume work, which unfortunately is just considered a corporate finance textbook, so nobody ever really reads it, called Financial Policy of Corporations, which I commend the attention. It's a fascinating book with a huge number of huge long footnotes in the old tradition. And sort of footnote takes up, huh? Arthur S. Dewing, D E W I N G. Um, it's the old. <laughs> The old style classical footnote. We go on for about five pages, and you have footnotes onto the footnote. You know, I like that. A lot of people can't take it. But it's, <laughs> you don't have to read the footnotes. Doing's <laughs> um, uh, overall assessment, uh, his statement on the subject, we're going quantitative thing. Um, he says that you know the climax comes about really by 1901, a little bit by, by there's, there's scattering a number of new, more consolidated trust formation till, till 1903, they more or less stopped by then. And he says, why? He says, well, uh, the trust turned out badly. They didn't suppress competition. They didn't realize big economy, large-scale economies. The investors didn't realize uh, their expectations. The, the prices of the stock steadily declined. The promoters found that a large amount of the security even remained unsold. Few paid any dividends. Most of the trust actually, many of the trusts actually collapsed and actually went bankrupt. Uh, but doing this, he took a random sample of 35 of these trusts, industrial consolidations, of, the, of approximately, I don't know, it over, it's just kind of obscure exactly how many there were, certainly over 100, 130, maybe as high as 260, it's a little, a little vague. At any rate, he took a random sample of 35 industries, these kind of trust consolidations, he compared the earnings of the, of the constituent competing parts, competing firms, before the trust was formed, with the anticipated, anticipated earnings declared by the promoters or the bankers uh, when this trust was being formed, with the earnings for the first year after the trust was formed, and then 10 years after that. So in other words, you take the, what's happened, what happened to the individual companies before the trust, and what happened after the trust was formed. We found out on the average that the earnings just before the trust were 25% higher than the earnings the first year after the trust. <laughs> you know, I think an average 25% collapse. <laughs> uh, and also that the earnings before the trust were more than the average earnings for the first 10 years after the formation of the trust, and even, even for the 10th year. So as, long, as late as 10 years after the trust was formed, they're still making less profits than the original firms did before the whole thing was conceived. The estimates of the promoters, as, as far as the estimates of the promoters and bankers went, uh, the expectation of what would happen from these large-scale economies, supposedly in cooperation replacing competition, these estimates of the, of the promoters and bankers were 50% higher than the actual first-year earnings. So in other words, the, the actual earnings before the trust were 25% higher than the earnings afterwards, and the, ex the promoter's expectation averaged 50% higher than what actually happened, and, con and con also considerably higher than the first 10 years' worth of earnings. So the, the promoters that had overestimated even for the 10 years ahead. Or taking another set of statistics, looking in another way, uh, <clears throat> of, of, the of, of these 35 trusts, uh, 13 had first year e earnings equal to the pre trust, and 22 had uh, first year earnings less than the pre trust earnings. And this is also about the same ratio for the first 10 years after the trust was formed. As a matter of fact, only four had earnings equal to the anticipation of the promoters of these, of these 35. Um, or looking at it another way, um, earnings after the trust were expected to be 40% higher than before the trust. That was the average expectation by the promoter and the bankers, etc., were that you're going to have a 40% increase in earnings once you have this consolidation. But actually, happens you had 20% less in the first year and 10% less for the first 10-year period. So this is, gives you the sort of the range <laughs> of what happened. Uh, Dewey goes into some of the reasons for this. Uh, very interesting discussion. He says uh, the, the pools were too un uh, the they expected economies of large scale production. His expectations were based on a pure analogy, as I mentioned, I think last night or the night before. If bigger is better, then biggest is best, which turns out to be incorrect. This argument from analogy is not correct. They assumed there was no limit to economies of scale. They assumed there was no limit to successful organization size. Um, and uh, also, you point out that the, when you have this trust, everything is routinized and bureaucratized. You eliminate creativity, as we were talking about a couple of days ago. And uh, you elim eliminate the, 
the input of intelligence by each, the creative intelligence of each of the individual entrepreneurs, and, and you know, replacing it by this bureaucratic kind of setup. And he said, you know, you stamp out individual human judgment and initiative, which can't be replaced by automatic, automatic kind of routine processes. And he points out the management ability is scarce, or entrepreneurial ability is scarce. It's something which you guys didn't realize. And he says the loyalty was to each to their firm was weakened. So the individual entrepreneur no, no one really gave a damn because he was part of this huge, solid organization. And the, the personal touch, the personal salesman role was weakened, and so forth and so on. Also, uh, as he pointed out, that the a larger, this very large size was often a disadvantage, a handicap in competing with smaller and more mobile competitors. I mentioned the push car peddler. He didn't. He's, he's, more, he's a little squarer than that. But at any rate, it's that sort of analysis. Uh, he also points out that this very large size often raised the price of raw material too much. You know, you have this, this monopsony analysis, whatever it is. If you get very big and you start to keep buying this raw material, you, you raise the price. In the meantime, the small competitors can shop around in secret and sort of make secret deals with the, with the raw material suppliers. Uh, also, the small competitors had a lower overhead, so they could they could nip out in poor years. They could sort of get out of the business or sort of reduce their production in small years, and then nip back in in good years. And it's again more mobile in, in this competitive contest. Uh, and also, he points. Well, also, he didn't point this out. But I add to this. There's some very interesting studies have been made in the last. 10, 15 years, this, this fits in with our creativity discussion you know, yesterday or so, that most, it's, it's usually considered by, you know, orthodox historian, he quotes, considered while well, in the 19th century, most of the big inventors, the inventors of, of great new uh, products and processes were small and they were small businessmen or also independent, you know, people tickering their laboratory in the basement. But now in the 20th century, all the really big inventions have to come from big corporate Huge corporate R and D kind of fact, uh, uh, processes. Turns out it's not true. It's still true in the 20th century. The major inventions, the really fundamental creative inventions, have been still they're still being made by small independent guys in the backyard or in small laboratories and small firms. There have been several studies of this, which I commend to your attention. Uh, John Jukes's Jukes, Sewers, and Stolman's great work, on Sources of Invention, which I think is in the library here. Uh, goes through a systematic study of all the top inventions in the 20th century and shows that the largest part of them are still done by small types, small people, small firms. And uh, also other studies by Daniel Hamburg, his book called R&D, and by uh, Schmuckler and Nelson, and a whole bunch of other people now have done studies of, of invention and industry and innovation and demonstrated this, uh, I think, pretty successfully. I mentioned Xerox and, and Polaroid. There's one other heroic case, I think, which I sort of use my students students you have to have some sort of a grabber, something which is relevant in quotes these days to their concerns. So one of my favorite examples of this is the is the great is the greatest one well, of the great invention in modern times of, uh, in the shaving in the shaving field, which is of course the, the Teflon coated razor, razor blade. Uh, now before this happened, Gillette had I don't know, ninety percent they had a huge proportion of razor business. They were advertising everywhere, of course, every sporting event the last 40 years, all my life has been Gillette Tech, <laughs> or whatever, Gillette, you know, worldwide of sports, worldwide sports, or whatever. So, uh, and yet, despite this, we have this, this teeny little company in England, Wilkinson Sword Company, purely as a byproduct, so I'm stumbling into this, uh, develops this Teflon-coated uh, blade so they can use this, the other process, or stainless steel blade, or whatever, coated, coated with Teflon. And they produce it. They don't really care about blades. They, they're throwing it away. They're giving it away in a, in a, as a package deal to promote their swords. They really, the only thing they're really interested in is swords. They have these beautiful swords, you know, sharp and all the rest of it. Here's a, we also have a couple of blades we'll throw in <laughs> to show you what great swords we make. And uh, I remember this as you know, my own personal experience because they didn't want to promote it. And they had a little teeny office in Madison Avenue. You have to walk up, not in the swanky part of Madison Avenue, but the sort of Lower Madison Avenue, mean, you had to walk up two, three flights to go to the little office. And the word got around purely by word of mouth that <coughs> had these great blades that were terrific, much better than Gillette and Chick. And people in you know, lines would show up and they had to ration you know, one blade to a, to a customer. <laughs> and you, the line would form around the block and you go up there. And they were, they were driven by this fantastic demand by the word of mouth to start, to start the blade business. And not only that, but Gillette and all these other, other super giants were driven to, to, to copy 
driven to it. Otherwise, it would have gone under, despite their huge size, despite their enormous brainwashing advertising the last 40 years. There's another heroic example of you know, small enterprise invention. Competition, you know, busting through the cake of <laughs> custom. Um, so large scale, a lot, because the business is big, does not necessarily make it more competitive, more official, more innovative. And doing uh, another great, his other great book, which sums up a lot of the glucose and starch and leather and all the rest of it, uh, by doing called corporate promotions reorganizations. His is marvelous little preface where he sort of sums up his, his view of the world. And he says, quote, I have been impressed throughout by the, throughout by the powerlessness of mere aggregates of capital, capital the whole monopoly. I have been impressed, too, by the tremendous importance of individual innate ability or its lack in determining the success or failure of any enterprise. With these observations in mind, one may hazard the belief that whatever, quote, trust problem, unquote, exists will work out its own solution. The doom of the inefficient waits on no legislative regulation. It is rather delayed thereby. Restrictive regulation will perpetuate the, in the inefficient corporation by furnishing an artificial prop to support natural weakness. I love that. It's a solid social Darwinist rhetoric. By furnishing an artificial prop to support natural weakness, it will hamper the efficient by impeding the free play of personal ambition. Terrific. <laughs> sums up my view of big business and competition and trust problem. Okay, from this point, this concludes my lecture, second block of lectures, so to speak, on big business, the rise of big business and the fall of the trusts.